Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 61. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I am joined by Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, good to be back with you, Zaki. Well, uh, happy 2018 again. Again, and uh, we are recording this in our uh, government shutdown uh, bunkers, right? So <laughs> That's right. How, how are you holding up, my friend? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's it's uh, as long as I got my podcast microphone, I'm I'm good to go. So uh, net neutrality has been repealed. So we'll see how long this lasts. But for the time being, we can still communicate with the outside world. Wow. Um, any any thoughts on this like government shutdown? I mean, anything you'd because I, I, I always love your insight on these things. Uh, I, I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to kind of uh, put your thoughts together on any of this stuff. I mean, what w- what can you say, right? The the uh, the president on his one year anniversary of his inauguration manages to shut the government down. So if that is not the most apt metaphor for kind of where we're at, you know, uh, wow. it's it's cynical and and deplorable, not in the way not in the way that his supporters use that word as a badge of honor. It is just deplorable. And uh, we'll see what happens. But I don't you know, the, the, the ultimately, uh, the people in power are not going to pay any substantial price for this whereas the people uh uh who can ill afford uh the suffering will be forced to suffer the most because that tends to be the way of things uh, that very well said uh, very eloquently said uh of a, of a very uh grim reality uh yeah i try, yeah, I try yeah, I mean, not to be me, cynical but i mean it, it, no it is, you know? i mean well to me it's you know it, a sign of the times is where you know, um, hush money to a porn star to, you know, uh, so that she doesn't talk about an affair, alleged affair that you had, you know, back in 20, 2006 is like the least story in the news. You know, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, Any other that's president. That's like number eight. <laughs> you know. so number, right. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, the, the president tweeted that we're recording this on uh, Saturday, January 20th. Yeah. And the president tweeted this morning, he said, the Democrats gave me a gift of a government shutdown for my one year anniversary of my inauguration or something to that effect. Like I, you kind of keep track of how many times he says me, my, I. And I'm like, you know, it's a shame about the, the DACA kids that are currently being held hostage and the the, the, the children uh, who, who rely on CHIP who are currently being held hostage. But we don't have any word about them. This is all about, you know, the uh, little Lord Fauntleroy who uh, isn't getting his way, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I, I believe in the fairness and decency of the, the majority of the American people. And I think that this is one of those wake up calls that's going to happen. I mean, they want to try to spin this as being some great valiant thing. I don't think people are going to see it that way. They're going to see it as a party that has complete power over uh, yeah. all three uh, levers of government and and they are utterly incapacitated, you know? I mean, that's that's on them. So That's right. That's right. I think this is either the first time that I don't know if it's the whether the republic the first time the republicans have held all three houses or, or sorry all, all three branches or any one party has held all three uh, you know branches and yet we have a government shutdown so it's one of the two yeah uh, but but nonetheless it's an it's an indictment uh, to say the least but uh, anyway I guess to, to to somehow shift from that to uh, uh, who we have today and uh, well, I, I guess is, it's this kind is of perfect ap- this is actually perfect because because we're dealing with something that is stress inducing and is is putting our mental health at risk and so who better to talk to than our guest for today Zucky is the maestro at uh, at, at doing the uh, yeah hashtag nailed it <laughs> <laughs> so who do we have today, Zucky? Uh, so our guest is Dr. Heather Laird Jackson, and uh, uh, Dr. Heather Jackson newly minted doctor, nonetheless. Yeah. Very nice, Sorry. yeah. And and uh, uh, she works to reduce the stigma and perceptions of how mental illness is accessed and understood in all underserved communities. She has an online program, Muslims and Mental Health, and she's a doctor in psychology, holds an MPA, and has a master's degree in clinical psychology with a specialization in marriage and family therapy. She was an AAM. FT Doctor Fellow in the Minority Fellowship Program and an Albert Schweitzer Fellow. She was awarded the Global Psychology Award twice, and she received the Community Partnerships Award for her work with the LA County and Orange County Department of Mental Health. Her patients include many underserved minorities such as Arabs, Latinos, African Americans, Asians, South Asians, and LGBT clients. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. 
I, I also want to say this is kind of a first for us um, and for our listeners, uh, Zucky, in the sense that uh, we have never had both a husband and a wife on the podcast, not simultaneously, but although that's never happened either. That, but, that, that'll be uh, a first for us when we get there, too. Inshallah. inshallah, yeah, that's right. But 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 as a recurring guest, uh, and that is, of course, that uh, uh, Dr. Heather Jackson is also uh, the wife of Dr. Sherman Jackson. So um, we are really honored and deeply excited to have this conversation. Um, so thank you so much again for taking the time, as Zucky said. Um, you know, so I, I, I'd really like to just sort of go into it directly and kind of talk about your background and kind of where your roots come from. And, and uh, obviously, I think you probably have a very unique and fascinating journey to Islam as well. And we'd love to kind of maybe start there and, and then kind of delve into the work that you do, which is so critical. Wow, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> In the deep end. <laughs> um. Well, where to start? Um, well, I, I grew up in the Midwest um, in a small town in Indiana, and um, I, you know, it, it was a very uh, monochromatic town, <laughs> 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 and where even uh, people who were maybe of, of uh, similar color were also not considered um, of a similar, uh, you know, hierarchy, right? So like, for example, if you were Jewish uh, in the, the little town that I grew up in, you weren't considered white. Um, and I say that in a, in a context of not realizing that until I was much older. When I was growing up, it just seemed like the place where I grew up, right? There, wa there wasn't that um, ability to see all those dynamics until I was older. Um, but one of the realities of that, right, is I didn't meet a, even a person of color until I went to college. Um, I mean, not really meet them. Um, but my background a little bit, I mean, I grew up in a small town. Um, I used to be um, a tennis player and I wow. got so good at it that I started turning huh. <laughs> in, uh, in the summertime. And I, my sophomore year in high school in the humanities class, I was offered the opportunity to study Arabic. Um, oh, wow. High school. Program, mm. Yeah, the program was you would go to, I believe it was like Vermont or New Hampshire for the summer and study Arabic. And then you would go the next summer and study in Egypt for a summer uh, and get to use the Arabic and learn the culture of the Egyptians. And it was a fascinating opportunity, um, but at that time I was really, really into my tennis play and um, just an athlete in general. And I honestly, you know, nothing was really going to take me away from that at that time, but it did plant the, the seed, the idea. And so then when I got out of uh, high school, I had some different offers from different places to play tennis. But I had studied French in high school as my second language and really enjoyed that. I enjoyed languages, period, and as well, learning about others. Um, but that was very limited uh, where I grew up because even even that humanities class, which inspired this this whole thing, um, was the textbook, even when it talked about Muslims, for example, was in such a derogatory way that I really was not, you know, influenced to learn about Muslims. Um, but in any case, I had decided that I liked French so much that I wanted to add to my language. So that idea of Arabic had been planted wasn't really sure what I wanted to study uh, in college. So I know what my parents wanted. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer. They wanted me to, you know, grow up, be a lawyer, you know, marry a senator, that kind of thing. Um, but I didn't, uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I decided to study Arabic. 
Marrying a senator is pretty specific. Wow, I have to hand it. I have to hand it. To, I have to hand it to your parents. That's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, I grew up in a very um, Republican family. Oh wow. Okay, that should and... make for interesting conversation if we still carry the same party lines. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so well, I yeah, I kind of got out of that entirely. Um, but the. The, the thing was, right, yeah, they had a very specific idea in mind of what they wanted me to do. Um, but, uh, and, you know, I mean, it was something that was um, normal in my family, right? My, my grandfather ran for office, not, not a Senate office, but he was involved in local politics. And mm. uh, growing up, you know, it was always, you know, politics in the house, you know, hearing about politics. And um, my fir- I went on, when I was eight years old, I went on my first canvassing campaign with my family to put flyers and, you know, people's homes uh, to, you know, vote for this person or that person. So I, I became very well acquainted with that. But, and, and actually, one of the things I had thought about doing, um, because I had a brother, you know, uh, who was two years older than me, and he was a Marine, and uh, later on became a police officer. And I had two adopted brothers um, that my father had adopted uh, who were both also in the military at one point and one of them also became an officer um, who was actually killed in the line of fire. But I had thought actually of working for either the FBI or the CIA. And (laughs) so I had gone and uh, I made my major Arabic, uh, you know, and um, well, it was actually called Near East Studies at the time, but then they, they changed it and split it between Islamic Studies and Arabic. Mm. But it was uh, Arabic and political science were my two majors. Um, and so I started taking classes. And within the first year of um, my freshman year, I had met you know, a number of people in my class who also had similar interests as me, but then I also started meeting Muslims. Um, and I met lots of people of different backgrounds and in, in, in various, you know, colors and um, was just, you know, taken away with, um, with all of the learning that occurred, you know, that year. And huh. one of the right. courses I had to take for, um, my Near East studies was a a class on the Quran. And I had been probably since the age of 12 or 13 kind of searching for my religious identity because my father's side of the family was Catholic, Irish Catholic. I was just about to ask. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My mother's side of the family were Protestant Methodists. And so I would go to church on Sundays and I would also, you know, go to mass on some Sundays. Um, and uh, it's not that I, you know, I, I just couldn't find the theology agreeing with me, right? Or me agreeing with the theology of either uh, church. I had had um, some significant confusion around the Trinity. And I, would ask the priest and I would ask the preacher for assistance and guidance and understanding this concept and they just could never really answer it to my satisfaction. Um, but, you know, I didn't dislike my community and I didn't, you know, I, I did believe in God. And so I kind of went on the search and I, and I looked at, I started reading things like Zen Buddhism and, uh, you know, about Judaism. and. In high school, I switched and left both the Catholic Church and my mother's Protestant Church and went to this other Protestant Church called the Christian Church. And my main reason for doing that was because they had a great youth group. Um, It was very vibrant and active, and I really enjoyed the camaraderie of others who believed in God. Um, Because it was, you know, a safe environment, we did lots of, of cool things together. 
but still, that theology, that the, those theological questions were out there, and I and I was still searching. So when I got to college, you know, you have this new found freedom, and I was taking this Quran class. Well, we st I was reading Surah Al-Baqarah, and it like answered all my questions <laughs> about the about the Trinity, right? Huh. Wow. And I, what I had sort of innately believed um, was right there. It was right there in black and white, you know? Um, and mind you, this is a, a translation. Um, it's not the actual Arabic, right? But still, the translation itself was powerful. Um, and it was powerful enough that I was like, I don't know what this is exactly, but I want this. This is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, and so I asked, at the time, my first roommate in college was also a Malaysian uh, Muslim. And she had come to uh, the United States to, she came to IU where I went to school to learn English. Um, and then she was going on to Duke. But she, while she was at IU, she had taken off her hijab because she didn't really understand why she was wearing it. And now that she herself had some freedom, she wanted to explore that that whole issue, and actually, I mean, this was the color of Allah because had you know, being a tennis player, you know, not used to wearing a whole lot of uh, clothing. Uh, if she had been wearing hijab, probably we would not have connected at that. I mean, to be honest with you, at that point, right. the fact that she was even going through her own parallel journey was perfect timing, and that. We, you know, I observed her. She got up. She she wasn't wearing hijab, but she prayed every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and and at first, her fajr prayer was really annoying to me. Um, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I wanted to sleep. Right. Uh, but um, and and there are a lot of you know my habits uh, as a an American that were really annoying to her as well. So, um, you know, but but I got to see her actually living her Islam and the Malaysians have this really cool, you know, very easygoing, um, you know, expression of Islam. It's very, uh, you know, it felt like very free flowing. So, you know, and the, and the, the dorm that I lived in at the time was called the um, Living Learning Center, right? International Living Learning Center. And the idea of the living space was that they paired up Americans with, um, with foreigners to get another learning experience, right? So our whole dorm was full of people from other places, but a lot of Malaysians. Anyway, um, when I discovered that this is what I wanted to do, I had an Arabic tutor at the time uh, helping me, and I went to them and said, you know, how do I do this? I want to I wanna become Muslim. And not knowing fully what that entailed, right? I, at that point, I wasn't even aware of hijab, for example. Um, but I went, the, the Malaysians, they hooked me up with um, a Malaysian traditional outfit and <clears throat> I got, you know, dressed in it, went to the mosque and, and, and said my shahada. Um, and it was a really special experience. Um, but that was the beginning to, of me becoming a Muslim. Right, right. Um that's that's fascinating. Uh, what was it about like the uh, what 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 you found in in Surah Al-Baqarah, as you mentioned, you know, like the second chapter of the Quran, um, in terms of theology that sort of appealed to you, and and what was it was it sort of Christian Trinitarian theology that that just didn't you know it didn't speak to you? Right. Um, you know, I wish I could remember the exact passage. No, no right. <laughs> but I I, I don't. Um, I just you know remember that much. Uh, it, but yes, that, that is the issue that it resolved for me, right? Because it made, uh, I, I never really believed that Jesus was God, right? Um, and it just never sat with me. And that's not to disrespect those who, who do, um, but just to say that, that it just never sat with me. And, you know, it resolved it. You know, Jesus is a prophet, right? Um, right, right, exactly. I totally believe that. Right. And, you know, even a high prophet totally believe that I believe in the miracles. Right. But I just didn't I could not make God in the you know form of a human body. It just didn't work for me. 
Um, so now you, you, you take your Shahada. Uh, this is it while in undergrad, I forget, or, or you're right, in grad school? Like freshman year in college. Freshman year, wow. Oh, okay. I had started college. I was still, um, mm -hmm. I think I was just turning 17 when I started college, uh, or yeah, about that. So I had started, you know, I was a, young, a younger college student uh, starting. Uh, now, do you go on to graduate school as well at, at uh, Indiana University, or you? No, you actually, um, so it was, a, I had left um, and had an experience overseas. Um, okay. And um, when I was leaving, uh, my husband came to Indiana, and, um, but at that time, you know, I met him in passing uh, right before I left, I, and then I left, and I came back, I, I spent, you know, uh, not a year, but close, you know, close to a year uh, overseas, and uh, Abu Dhabi, actually. Mm, okay. And then um, I came back and um, was living with my parents for the first couple months because uh, there wasn't, uh, it was mid-semester, right? So, they lived, you know, in a different city than I grew up in, but it still was a small town, Indiana, and there were no Muslims there. Um, and so some of my friends would reach out to me occasionally, and because the nearest mosque was, let's say, um, an hour and a half away. Wow. Um, and, wow. Um, by the way, my parents weren't really happy about me becoming Muslim. <laughs> I was just going to ask, like, what their response was. I'm but, sure, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, my friends, you know, I had a friend, uh, friends that were a couple, married couple, and they had invited me to come out to Indianapolis to go to the mosque there. Well, there's a couple of mosques there, but one particular one. So I went out and I visited them and um, my husband was, was there. And after the um, Juma prayer, we, they introduced us, you know, formally and um you know we just were introduced and that was it and we went our own ways then a few weeks later um there was a mass convention in detroit and the same couple were like we're worried about you because it was near christmas time i guess and they were like we want to you know get you out of out of uh the no muslim land <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and take you somewhere inspirational so uh, why don't you go with us, you know, up to, up to this convention? And we were all college students back then and broke. I mean, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of like one of those things where you carpool and then you live on pizza because right. what else can you afford to eat, right? And yeah. then you wake up in the morning and eat cold pizza. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, six to a hotel room or something like that. Yeah, that's yeah right. I've been there. That's yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, we used to have one guy who was designated the bathtub, you know, just because we ran out of bed, you know, <laughs> like ran out of bed space and floor space. Yeah. So been there. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, one of the people in our in our group, his uncle was um, a uh, like a scholar um, from overseas, and he we he wanted me to meet him, and when I met him, he said to me and uh, his nephew, uh, I think she should marry, you know, Sherman Jackson, right? Huh. And it was a weird sort of experience, but it got even weirder, right? So like, so we, you know, I mean, I hadn't thought of, I mean, there's like a significant age difference between my husband and myself. So we went back to, um, they dropped me off. We all went home. And when I got home, my mom said, <clears throat> you had a phone call uh, while you were gone. A Dr. Jackson called for you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how did he even get my number? <laughs> you know, right. I mean, this guy's got skills. So he like somehow <laughs> got my family's <laughs> number. For sure, for sure. And I don't think that's how he got it, right? Because right, right. I hadn't given it to him. I mean, I'm assuming my friends gave it to him. I honestly still to this day don't know how he got my number. <laughs> um, but you know, he had called and so he called back and um, then, uh, you know, we talked for a couple of hours actually. And, you know, he was asking me about, 
um, when I had plans to come back to Indiana. You know, it was all very cordial and everything. Uh, but um, then he called again, and my mom was like, hmm. <laughs> First of all, I can tell by his voice that he's, yeah. you know, black, right? Black, right. This issue. Secondly, you know, men don't call you for, you know, just to chat, right? But I was, you know, a bit naive about those things. And so, um, I, you know, I didn't think anything of it, but like my, my parents did, right? So huh. she's like, I want to know what his intentions are. And so after a couple more conversations, I ask him, you know, look, my parents want to know, you know, why you keep calling me, what your intentions are. And he told me he was interested in marrying me. And so that started the process of us uh, meeting and him meeting my family. And in about three months, we were married. Wow. Um, and we've been married for going on, the, in April will be 24 years. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so then I went back to Indiana and we um, were in the same department, which, you know, was kind of um, interesting and that, that sort of steered me toward focusing more on political science at that point. Um, because suddenly my professors wanted me to write like my husband. <laughs> oh, wow. And that was a lot of pressure. So, uh, you know, but any, in any case, um, so we, we actually, so I actually didn't end up, I finished my degree at Indiana from afar because my husband, you know, went to teach at Wayne State and then for a year and then went to University of Michigan. So I had to finish up, you know, coming back during summers and all kinds of things creatively to finish up my bachelor's degree at IU. Um, but then, um, then I got my first graduate degree uh, in Michigan at uh, Eastern Michigan University in uh, public administration and nonprofit management. Um, and then, you know, my other graduate degrees are from here in California, which are in <laughs> uh, marriage and family therapy. And then my doctorate is in uh, clinical psychology with a focus on marriage and family therapy. So, so and, and those are the fields that you've been working in? Well, interestingly, um, I have been doing a general, um, I've been doing general work uh, because, in terms of the clients that I treat, uh, because there are so few culturally competent therapists for our community right. um, that I kind of get a general population. Um, I hope one day to be able to just have my practice be completely focused on the areas that I'm really interested in. Um, but I don't think that that's going to happen really soon. But it, it'll probably happen within my career, just not really soon. Um, as we get more and more people in the field. I think, right. I think the community, right. You, you, like once there's a maturation in the community where we begin to see you know, um, like real expertise develop in this field because, I mean, obviously, as you as you already sort of alluded to, it remains not only understudied, uh, but but also, um, and, and this is kind of one of the things I did want to talk to you about, um, which is just the general um, stigma that people have um, in our community associated with seeking mental health or seeking um, you know counseling or uh, mental health issues in general. Um, can you maybe speak to that or, or speak to that a little bit in terms of what you what you think are the reasons for that? Uh, is it cultural or, or are they cultural or, you know, is it something else? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, because our community is so diverse, there's lots of lots of answers to that question, right? Yeah. But generally speaking, the stigma literature that we have refers to a few different types of stigma, right? So there's public stigma. Uh, meaning kind of what the outside world, how they view you, you know, um, and then self-stigma where how you view yourself when you look in the mirror. Um, there was, there, there are a couple scholars in the field who have tried to break that down even further into a couple other categories, uh, namely label avoidance, meaning that you're trying to avoid a particular label, and the other one being um, structural stigma 
referring to access to care. So in some um, communities where uh, typically impoverished communities, uh, they don't have either transportation to access to care or care within their area. Um, and that would be structural stigma. So that in and of itself is going to affect a different population of people than, say, the more affluent uh, communities. Right. But I mean, I, I would think that, you know, what you like, I think in, in those kinds of communities that, that are, as you said, you know, where, where there's uh, structural issues and there, you know, perhaps there's, um, they, 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 they are, they, they come from impoverished communities. Um, you know, there, there's probably limited access mm -hmm. to, to, to medical care in general, and then certainly, uh, you know, right. um, mental health within that scope. Um, I guess, my, uh, you know, coming from obviously a middle class to, uh, let, let's say, affluent, uh, um, you know, uh, subcontinent, Muslim, you know, upper middle class sort of background, um, you know, I, just in my own um, just anecdotal experience, you know, mm -hmm. seeing the kind of and a stigma that's associated with mental health among people who have wonderful health care, who have excellent access to doc, you know, physicians and medical care. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you know, attend a social event and not, you know, and not bump into five, you know, five doctors. Right. So, you know, it, it, I, I guess, is there any research out there in terms of what it is about, um, you know, and, and this is probably not unique to the right. Muslim so community, but Right, among these no, kinds no, no. of communities. No, you, this is a good point, right? So that this is where I, I circle back to public stigma and self-stigma. Right, thank you. Because, yeah, there is research. Actually, I did my dissertation on this. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. So, um, you know, yes, I mean, and, and the thing is, with uh, my dissertation, I could not prove that label avoidance and structural stigma were relevant in the community that I studied. But then again, that was a more middle, middle to upper class community, right? Um, but the public stigma and self-stigma were very relevant, and they were relevant for different reasons. Um, and that's where the diversity piece comes in, right? Uh, for a lot of Muslims, there's stigma around it just because of different things they've learned about Islam and the way they've understood or perceived certain um, advices like, you know, not sharing their business outside of the family or not talking badly about their brother or sister, or those kind of things, right? Um, they question, well, can I actually talk to somebody else, number one, right? Also, if I do talk to somebody else, don't they have to be a scholar? Don't they have to be an imam? Um, which is interesting because most of those people, we don't have a lot of duly trained people. Um, and we've discovered, right, that a lot of our imams, they just don't have the training to handle some of these issues. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and, and the scholars, definitely, this is not, although they know many things that are helpful to what we do, that's not what they do. Um, and, I mean, they don't do the actual treatment, right? Well, well some of them, maybe. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's a bigger uh, question there. But, um in any case, they, the population seem to believe that there might be a conflict with, with seeing a therapist and their Islam. That's, that's one issue. Another issue is, well, what is Western psychology, right? Um, many people trace it back to Freud, and Freud had some concepts that may be incongruent with uh, what we believe as Muslims. And so that's another uh, sort of fear that people have that if I partake in something having to do with psychology, then that somehow is equated to Freud, which, you know, at this point, even in Western psychology, we've, we've broken out way beyond Freud. Um, right, right. And, you know, like with marriage and family therapy, for example, which is a lot more congruent with uh, our Islamic principles and values than, say, you know, straight psychology. Uh, and mainly because it, it focuses on relational aspects of, of relationships, right? Which is what a lot of the issues that people have are, um, with the exception of things like that are, that are more biochemical in nature. Um, so, so that's, uh, marriage and family therapy is, I think, a bit more palatable to our community. Um, but, because it also works with systems and, right. you know, 
we are a we are, we are more inclined toward collectivism than we are individualism in our community. Mm, great so point. That shift as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, great point. And then so so I, I guess perhaps what you're alluding to is the fact that at least in that area uh, we do find uh, less less reticence, you know, within the Muslim community to seek counseling or help when it comes to, you know, the breakdown of relationships, whether it be marriage or uh, or, or or even other relationships, correct? Right, because we're still we're still a family centered community. Right. Um, right. And one of the last you know holdouts of that. Right. <clears throat> and so but when it comes to um, just people who are say recover you know individually recovering from say trauma or have experienced mm -hmm. trauma or right. have to just need to speak to a counselor for their own uh, for their own individual or self-care needs um, th th there is still that like you identified those sort of stigmas associated sure. with that right right there's very many many stigmas right and we, right. we've seen that even um, most recently this year with the whole hashtag me too right? Um, hmm. Well, actually, that's a. I mean, it's funny you bring that up, or not funny, but just interesting you bring that up because I, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk to you about this, uh, <laughs> just because, you know, I mean, I didn't, I, you know, it, it, there were so many areas that I wanted right. to cover, but I, you know, I, because you identified that one particular, um, the, like with the Me Too movement and, uh, uh, you know, with the recent sort of. Uh, uh, you know, instances we've had, unfortunately, within our own community of high profile cases of, uh, you know, so-called spiritual abuse. And we've actually had like, you know, people who've been involved directly with those cases on the podcast, um, mm. you know, to talk about those cases. Uh, but I mean, that's a real trauma. I mean, you know, th th those are real. I mean, those are real in in instances and real issues in the community. And, you know, uh, people who Unfortunately, are you know have 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 uh, unfor you know have say have, have faced that have had to, are I'm sure have you know are you know have to seek counseling or therapy of some kind. Uh, I, I don't know if you had any well, sort of insight into any of that process. Yeah. Yeah, certainly it would be a, <clears throat> if they've experienced something you know anywhere from harassment to uh, violation, right? Um, I would definitely encourage them to seek therapy because. What we don't often realize is that when we are um, struggling with something ourselves, it doesn't just affect us, right? It affects the whole system of people that we're engaged with. And so when we don't address those issues, they can pass from generation to generation. And that's another part of the research that I did that I found, right? Is that, um, and I'll, I'll come back to the, the Me Too directly in a minute, but... Um, the, if we, even if we look at people from South Asia, for example, right, uh, that were affected by the partition, we still see intergenerational trauma that's, that's presenting itself, even if people don't recognize it on a conscious level, right? We still see how it has affected patterns of behavior within the family. Hmm. Um, and we see the same thing in African American families with slavery. Um, and so, you know, traumas can pass generationally if they go unaddressed. Um. But we're going back to the hashtag me too. Yes, um, I have had, you know, we, we had two events here in LA around hashtag me too. And, <clears throat> you know, it was, you know, they were interesting on it for a number of reasons, but um, a lot of people, women and men, because men are tra traumatized as well, right? Um, don't seek help because of the stigmas around having admitted to trauma. Um, you know, it, it affects, or at least it's believed, right, that it will affect your marriage ability. Right. Um, right. It will affect um, how the community perceives you. Right. Um, and unfortunately, far too many times, the first time people are hearing about someone having had trauma is after they're married. Oh, and then yeah, that's sure. a whole set of issues because, you know, on the one hand, the person who's been traumatized still needs to deal with their trauma. On the other hand, the person who wasn't traumatized but thought they were signing up for one thing finds out they actually signed up for something else. And that presents its own set of issues. 
Right. I mean, like, again, the marriage or the relationship exacerbates those sort of latent issues, right, that have been uh, perhaps, in, well, in one case, unaddressed or in another, come to the surface because of this new kind of relationship. Um, right. And I think that's an interesting point. I mean, and I don't know if this is necessarily related, but I mean, you know, uh, within traditional Muslim communities, you know, because of the general sort of um, prohibition against dating and things like that, I mean, a lot of people don't are, you know, uh, haven't been intimate until they're married uh, or, or aren't in intimate relationships until they're married. And so those issues of trauma, uh, let's say in, in the in the instance of, of someone who, who has that kind of a background and brings that to the relationship, it, 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 it remains dormant or latent, right? Because it, right. You know, they haven't been in intimate relationships and now suddenly they're in this very intimate marriage and, you know, those things come to the surface, I would imagine. Right, no, that's exactly right, right? So uh, take, for example, uh, someone who's been perhaps uh, molested as a child and um, let's say they were five or under the age of five, they may not even really be connected to it um, because when they were so young, right? And it isn't until somebody else touches them in the same place or in the same way that the memories come flooding back. And so, um, and, and what we'll often see, if it's a woman, for example, who has been traumatized, um, let's say she was molested as a child, uh, she'll have pain associated, you know, with her um, vaginal area or vulva, you know? Um, and that's very common. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, what ends up happening, oftentimes they blame themselves, you know, I mean, there's a whole process here that happens. Sort of uh, self-shaming, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, a self-shaming. Mm -hmm. um, and blaming, you know, self-blaming. Self -blaming. Right. Um, and then also, when it, once you're in that marital re relationship, sometimes the partner will blame themselves, right? Like, for feeling guilty about, you know, maybe her, what they perceive as hurting the other person or, mm -hmm. or just not even knowing what to do, right? Right, right. Um, but, yeah. Right. Um, I, I guess beyond, you know, these kinds of uh, cases that you come across, um, you know, do you find that, um, you know, and I don't mean to kind of shift away from it, but, but this is probably all sort of inter interrelated, but, uh, you know, the fact that as a community, um, you know, uh, because of the sort of stigma of, you know, of Islamophobia and against, the, you know, the, the kinds of things that we're seeing, the, the kind of vitriolic language against Islam and Muslims, um, are, you know, do, we, do you encounter that kind of trauma? People who are just, you know, a certain fear or, do you know what I mean? Like associated with the, 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 the stigma of, uh, um, associated with being Muslim, period. Uh, whether whether they're observationally Muslim, i.e., in the case of Muslim women who wear wear the hijab, for example, or 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 just you know they may not be identifiably Muslim, quote unquote, but they still carry that you know that feeling of being stigmatized. So this is a very complex question. <laughs> okay, sorry. And I, well, I want to try to I want to try to unpack it here for you in, in a simple form, but like it's a complex question because okay. yes to all the above, right? Um, okay. And it's not just out. It's not just in the um, sphere that's outside of our community, but it's also intra-community, right? Wow. Um, right. So right. we have, uh, you know, many of the social issues that are in the dominant culture are also a part of our, you know, micro culture. Um, so we do have people dealing with Islamophobia. But um, we also have people dealing with issues of racism and um, acceptance and tribalism and, uh, you know, so, so many issues. But in terms of Islamophobia, yes, um, uh, people have expressed, uh, you know, feeling, um, I mean, uh, just a range of things from everything from, you know, occupational stress to... Uh, you know, uh, being a college student and the stress that the college students face, um, although their expression is somewhat different. And circling back to your comment about dating, um, we do see a different dynamic happening in our college campuses, right? Mm. Uh, where people are actually engaging in all kinds of sexual acts, 
um, and doing everything but having, you know, vaginal sex uh, so that they have created this narrative in their minds that uh, we're not having Xena as long as we don't have, you know, vaginal sex. So they're doing everything under the sun uh, except for that. And it's, you know, forgetting that it's still haram, but like, you know, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. Um, and we also see another trend we're seeing on that level is that, uh, you know, this new trend of, and it has to do with race a little bit, but um, women, you know, sleeping with non-Muslim men, right? Um, and not, it, it's so, it's so, it's so sad, honestly, because they don't realize the full ramifications of what they're doing until it's done. So right. when they embark in this, these, these, um, this way of, of behaving, uh, and they get dropped, you know, like a hot potato, wow. uh, they don't, they don't see that coming because their tradition has been that men are upstanding, that men will marry you, that men will stay, right? And so when they do depart from that and start this journey of uh, going outside of that in the name of whatever they want to call it, um, uh, it it really messes with them, right? Because they, they they're not expecting the outcome that that anybody outside of that is going to see that that would be the outcome, right? Because that's what mm -hmm. that whole you know culture is about. Um, people who engage in Xena regularly. It is about temporary relations. Do you do you feel like um, you know the the omnipresence of social media has sort of exacerbated these problems and and sent them in directions that were just I mean unheard of. You know it, I mean we we know in in broader cultural terms obviously the impact of social media, but more specifically uh, when it comes to within the Muslim community specifically in Muslim youth. Uh, there's there's an inability, uh, maybe intergenerationally, to to account for or acknowledge these issues. Absolutely, um, I you know there's a huge disconnect, and and there's a couple of reasons for that. I think social media is is certainly a contributor because it allows people to become what I call, and I'm not the only one who calls them this, but keyboard warriors, right? Right. Um, where they say things to each other and ways that they would never do face to face. And it has actually caused the younger generation problems in terms of their interactions socially with others. They got, they honestly don't know how to, to interact, um, sometimes appropriately with their elders or, you know, other people. Yeah. Um, when, when I was in college, you know, and, um, had become Muslim, there was such a sense of community amongst the Muslims, right? And we would volunteer endlessly for things. We would, um, I mean, there's a whole nother story I could tell you about how I was homeless for a minute and the Muslims, you know, gave me a place to stay, but um, having to do with my family, you know, rejecting me, uh, but the, um, but the Muslims would step up to anything, right? We see this younger generation where they <clears throat> they don't do that, right? Hmm. Uh, they don't necessarily, they might volunteer, but the volunteerism is nothing like it used to be. <laughs> right. Um, they're just, they just have another reality. And then part of it is influenced by social media um, because the social media has, we already have an educational system and, and secondary education, higher education, right? Um, whereby the focus is, is very much liberalism. Uh, so we, that, that already exists and it already pushes individualism. Um, so they're already being torn between their collective identity and this push for individualism. Right. But in addition to that, you've got social media, which is like individual all done one crack. <laughs> you know, I was just gonna say, right, and, right. You know, pushing them even farther. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're, they're just doing what the system, you know, the larger system is reinforcing for them. 
it, it's not because they're inherently bad kids, right? But it's the system that's in place that's supporting this behavior. Um, and, <laughs> Jeez. You know, between that and, you know, the uh, generational differences, let's say, uh, that I encounter a lot between uh, immigrant parents and non-immigrant children, right? Right. Uh, that divide, because one is about survival, like the parents who immigrated, they're trying to survive this setting. And mashallah, we've seen amazing stories of that, right? Where not only did they survive, but they created a thriving family situation. Uh, and, you know, but then the children are disconnected from them because the parents were surviving, which didn't give them a lot of time to investigate and learn and, you know, all about the real happenings of what their children were going through. So um, there's a lot of work to be done and repair there in terms of them getting to actually know each other in a real way. Um, because they know each other, but in a way that may not be real. Um, huh. and, it, and oftentimes does create conflict for the child or the young adult to be able to really express themselves to their parents because they're afraid, right? Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's the, the notion of, of having multiple identities and you're showing uh, different facets of yourself to different audiences. Right. And sometimes those are hard to reconcile. Right. So, uh, yeah. Great point. Yeah. Um, I, I think Zucky squeezed in that social media question, um, you know, for past listeners of the show. Um, Zucky had asked doc the other Dr. Jackson about social media, <laughs> and the other Dr. Jackson turned the question on Zucky for asking. So oh. uh, I think Zucky was, Zucky was dealing with his own trauma this, about this asking. This is redemption. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that you know, was... the thing is, I actually have had a love-hate relationship with social media myself. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's I think that's everybody. Yeah, I mean it's it's great for advertising uh, things that are upcoming, you know, um, great articles to read, things to do. Uh, it's not a great space for emotional comfort. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, particularly on Twitter which I liken to a Roman Colosseum, and also sometimes like a <laughs> shingle. Um, but, so you know, it's, I see a lot of people in pain on Twitter, and they express themselves so vulnerably and so emotionally to the point where I really just would like to tell them or encourage them to go see a therapist. Yeah. Mm. Um, because it's not going to get addressed on social media. Um, and it's a very false sense of camaraderie and support on social media. Huh. It doesn't have any legs. Yeah. It, you know, it just, just picking up on what you're saying, I'm reminded of a thing that I saw uh, sort of occur on social media in the last two weeks or so. Uh, the, you know, the comedian Sarah Silverman uh, was you know she had posted some some something critical of the president or whatnot and and some rando on Twitter uh, just goes after her with you know sexist comments misogynist comments and it, you know whenever that kind of thing happens the 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 instinct is to just sort of engage and and punch back as hard or harder and what fascinated me about this particular interaction is she actually clicked over to his his Twitter feed or his Twitter profile and she saw the other things that he tweeted about and they included things about dealing with depression and loneliness etc and she reached out to him saying listen I see that you're dealing with this and I want you to know I understand and I'm here to talk to you and try to point you in the right direction and it became Literally, I mean, you can see it play out in their back and forth. It became this dialogic moment, which is almost completely in opposition to the way that story tends to end on uh, on social media. And it's because we've got the, the, uh, these view screens up, you know, where we're not really seeing each other. We're just seeing the words bereft of context. And, and the story ends with her saying, hey, can somebody, is somebody out there in Twitter uh, near him to maybe, you know, uh, who, who's a, uh, a 
practitioner of uh, of mental health, et cetera, can they see him? And and somebody, uh, you know, was able to see him. And I thought, my gosh, this is this is extraordinary. But it is it's extraordinary yeah, because it's so rare. Extraordinary. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it really is. Um, wow. I, I I mean, I I had uh, heard about the story. I didn't know the specifics. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Um, uh, I think uh, Heather, before we let you go, I mean, I, I just did. I, I did want to talk to you about um, real quick, and then we. I did want to talk about the conference as well. But um, a, any sort of words for uh, where you think that you know, so perhaps words of advice for uh, not only young Muslims who are um, who who are thinking about entering the field, but also um, you know, maybe things that you'd like to see on a communal level in terms of. Uh, trying to break some of that stigma associated with uh, allowing people within our own community from, you know, to seek counseling and mental health when it's, uh, when, when it's needed. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry, that's another big one, I know. Yeah, I, no, I, I it's, it's um, you know, the truth of the matter is that we all have issues. We're human beings, right? Um, and none of this is perfect, and that is one of the one of the uh, social issues that we face within our own community quite frequently, right? Which is this inability to accept that we aren't perfect, um, that we don't have utopian communities, and there are real issues that need to be addressed, and sometimes they're beyond our ability to address them individually. And, you know, it can be anything from as small as, um, you know, I, I'm feeling sad, but I'm just feeling a little too sad, um, to I want to get married and I need a clue about how to do this, you know, and get premarital counseling. Because mental health in America includes such a spectrum of issues, right? Um, as opposed to other countries like in the UK, we had a delegation come to LA from the UK and we learned a lot about how differently they view mental health. Um, for them, it has more to do with, at least what this delegation presented, that it has more to do with, you know, the hardcore issues of like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, you know, the, the ones that are, are typically associated with mental illness. Right. Uh, but in America, we're much broader than that. We look at not only those issues, but we also look at everything relational. So family dysfunction yeah. and marital uh, strife. So there's a lot of issues that can be looked at through going to a therapist. Um, and we all have issues. At one point in your life or another, you're going to have issues. None of us gets out of this dunya without having tried to uh, go through something, right? Without having experienced something, some difficulty. Um, but that's not all therapists are for, to be honest with you. We also take people who are super overachievers to a higher level. <laughs> you know, we do that too. Um, so it, it really is a broad spectrum. In terms of the advice we need, I mean, we have, you know, some students that are upcoming, which we'll be highlighting at the conference, but um, there are so many more people needed. If you think about um, what we know about what a therapist can do, right? After uh, uh, 34 clients, right? Um, a therapist becomes ineffective. So, and what I mean by that, like, you know, you take your regular 40 hour work week. Now, therapists can work a 40 hour work week, but 40 of those hours cannot be seeing clients. You can't see 40 clients a week. I mean, they can, people do it, but it's after 34, they become ineffective. So those last six clients or so don't get the full, you know, uh, work or, uh, of the therapist. When you think about that, that's not a lot of people that one therapist can treat. Hmm. Um, yeah. And so we need a lot of therapists when you consider our population size. Um, and though even though we're still a minority uh, in this in this country, uh, we 
we still need a lot of therapists and, and therapists who are culturally competent mm -hmm. um, because that doesn't seem to really exist out there in, the, in our schooling, in our training. Uh, one of the classes I also teach, um, but I teach grad students um, and have been for a couple of years in public health and in marriage and family therapy. And one of the things that we teach in marriage and family therapy, every every cohort has to go through a diversity class, right? The textbook that is in the field for diversity, um, you know, the authors did the best job they could do, but they only have eight pages in their book about Muslims, and it's lumped together with Arabs. Mm. So it's Arabs and Muslims. In right. Eight <laughs> right. Which doesn't really cover our reality as American Muslims, right? At at all, yeah. yeah. So they really don't learn about our community. Um, one of the things we're trying to do at the Center uh, for Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology is we are training interns. Well, we will be training interns who are Muslim or not Muslim, but want to work with Muslims, right? And how to be more culturally competent therapist um, and you know we've been blessed uh, with space at USC to do this um, but the center itself is not meant to be just at USC our plans are to expand the center to at least four more universities within five years very ambitious plan but that's that's our hope um, because Muslims are not just in California <laughs> Only the really smart ones. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's highly offensive joke for people yeah, who don't live in California. <laughs> I still have a lot of attachments to Michigan, so I know, I know. I and it's I, I in fact, I even make that joke in 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 part because I know, um, you know, you and I first connected in in the Midwest, and then we. Yeah. We sort of found ourselves here in California and kind of love it out here, and we kind of joke about uh, that. So, that, 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 yeah, it was sort of an yeah. inside joke. I but, mean, uh, it's, it's really hard to. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I, I I was just talking to a friend the other day in Michigan, and I was like, yeah, you know, that cold they described that's happening right now. And I guess Zeki in Chicago, you know, yeah. familiar with it as well. Like, it's yeah. uh, uh, not looking really appealing right now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> This and I, I got to be honest. I mean, speaking from a mental health point of view, I mean, you know, we you've got the sun shining, you've got true. you know, there is a and, and, and we do see in the Midwest. Yeah. That's right. Uh, many people have that affect disorder, the seasonal affect disorder, right, because of the lack of sun. I didn't even know that's what it was called, but there yeah. you go. There you go. So, um, uh, so Zucky, I, I, I'm sorry, Zucky has been wanting to ask you about the conference, and then I think yeah. we'll we'll and wrap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, well, just in general, I mean, this is a great opportunity to share uh, with our audience uh, what what this conference represents. And I was wondering if you could uh, give us give us an overview of what uh, what's planned. Sure. So the conference is one of the first actual initiatives of the center, which is again the Center for Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology. Um, our center is actually has three focuses. So it has a research focus which is research on the Muslim community. Um, it is uh, particularly around mental health, right? And then there's clinic, a small clinic for clinical services, and then we have community outreach. Well, one of the things that is sort of a um, cross between the research piece and community outreach is this conference. Um, and so on February 9th to the 11th, we will be having first a gala, which is more about the center because uh, we're going to be presenting the platform of the center and all the different projects that are under the center um, and having the opening session at the gala of the conference where we will discuss why now, like why are we doing this now. Mm -hmm. um, but the conference itself is called Moving Toward Defining an Islamic Psychology. And the reason that we decided to have this conference is because there's not a real clear understanding of what that means. Um, now, that's not to say that we don't have texts that talk about what look like or maybe an Islamic psychology. I mean, Imam Al-Ghazali talked quite a bit. Other scholars throughout the ages have talked quite a bit um, about something that looks like a psychology. Um, but in our modern day, right, it's not clear. Like, what does that mean? 
um, and what does exist in Western literature is written primarily by people who are not Muslim um, and who have a, their perspective, their lens is, you know, you know, affected by that. Um, as well, uh, the few Muslims who have, you know, deigned to write about this, um, there's just not enough out there where we would be able to say it's fully reliable or it's fully, um, y you know, it's, it's the reproduction of ideas over and over that are verified and by groups of people, right, that make them have staying power. Uh, and so the issue that we're faced with right now is there isn't enough written out there for us to make any kind of conclusion. And what is written out there is written mostly just by independent people um, thinking that, well, I know what it is, right? Um, and, you know, we're all entitled to our own opinion, but going back to our tradition, we're more of a collective, right? And it's not that, even though I would dream of, in a way, of having consensus on this issue, I also don't believe that even with the conference will reach a consensus, per se. Um, but what we hope to do with the conference is end up with a working definition that at least we can all agree upon. Um, because I'm pretty sure that given the different viewpoints that we have coming into this conference, people will not have a unanimous consensus on what that definition is, but at least we'll have a place of starting that is derived from a collective group of people. And that collective in and of itself is made up of, um, you know, the different disciplines of Islamic scholarship mm -hmm. and mental health professionals. So each session has two or sometimes more, uh, or in one case less, Islamic scholars and one mental health professional who has a caseload of at least 50% or more Muslim clients. And so the idea behind that is to have that interaction from these two perspectives, but also relevant interaction, right? That's right. Because it can be a mental health professional, but if you're not treating the Muslims, then it's, it's, it's a different experience. Right. If you're just a researcher, then you're also having a different experience. You don't know how it actually applies to um, the, the work on the ground. And we kind of need to skip that step. Now, the researchers, there, will, there are researchers who have been invited to the conference. And in fact, um, ISPU was invited, uh, you know, to bring um, scholars as well to, because what we're hoping is it's not like a traditional conference where it's paper driven. This is a little bit more unorthodox in the sense that we will be discussing uh, the different ideas, right? So everybody's coming and we have given them a set of questions to consider, but in each session they, a question will be discussed and it will be uh, answered until, you know, it's, it's, we feel like it's been answered, right? There, people aren't put on time limits. Um, the session itself has a time limit, but if we don't get, if we only get through like questions one and two, we don't get to three, then we don't get to it this year. Um, but we're ha it'll be an annual conference that inshallah will pick up next year where we leave off this year and add two, right? Um, right. So it's uh, more of a, a really a working conference. So our plan is to have papers uh, and articles out of the conference, but not beforehand. And right. So, uh, my hope is that at the end, and I'm, I'm trying to talk to a couple publishers right now about this, but to have one book that is about what the Islamic scholars had to say coming out of this about an Islamic psychology and a separate book about what the mental health professionals have to say. And then a third outcome is the actual training manual uh, for how to treat uh, Muslim clients from an Islamic psychological perspective. Um, having said that, I probably should have said this at the beginning. I think we have to differentiate between what we call Muslim mental health and Islamic psychology. Mm. And personally, I, I'll share my viewpoint on that, but I also want to say that it's not the only viewpoint, and I, you know, that's why I have a hesitation. Um, but nope. from my experience, I would say that 
anybody who comes in for therapy or anybody who's doing work around Muslims, that would be a sort of overarching category of Muslim mental health. Correct. Um, because there are people who identify as Muslim in name only, and they really don't care what therapy you use. They just come in for services, right? However, I would say on the other end of that spectrum are people who are not only Muslim in name, but they also practice. They pray, they fast, they do all of those things. And they want to utilize their practice within the therapeutic environment. Correct. That, right. or, you that, mean as a practitioner or, or those, you know, like, at, or, or the patients themselves? I guess both, I mean, right? The, well, yeah, probably both. Um, but probably who are both. you specifically referring to? I was specifically referring to clients, but... Right, right. Okay, that's yes. what I was thinking. Because yes, the practitioners as well, sure. Right. Some of them do. I mean, if we look at Halil Center, which is in uh, Chicago, and the Bay up there, right? And uh, we'll be opening down here. Um, Sheikh oh. Sohail is going to open a, a section of it in the valley. Um, oh, wonderful, okay. They, they take that perspective in general, right? So, right, right. And they've probably done the most work I would say around this of any of any center to this to this point, right? Muslim Muslim organization to date. Uh -huh. Yeah, I would say yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, well wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So people can certainly look into the Khalil Center um, to find out more information about what they do. Um, right. But I think yeah, you, you you like when you were when you were talking about people on the other end of the spectrum who. Yeah, I mean, not only have they identified the need to seek a therapist, but they have very deliberately sought out a Muslim therapist with the hope that not only will they be culturally competent, but perhaps offer insight from an Islamic perspective. And I think that's what you uh, are referring to when you say Islamic psychology versus just Muslim mental health. Correct. Right. That's how I would view it. But again, I am looking forward to the conference to seeing how others view it. Right. Um, now, uh, part of the reason why I view it that way is we actually had a real experience where um, in, in part of my practicum hours, uh, I, I was at Access California in uh, Anaheim. And Sheikh Suhail Mullah was there at the same time. Access being the uh, Arab American, I forget uh -huh. the acronym, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, don't know what it stands for either right now. Me neither, yeah, but it's, yeah, right. They, they uh, yes. had a big presence in Dearborn, I remember. That's yes, what I, they account. do. And um, uh, Sister Nahla Kayali, yes. she, um, she created it out here. Okay. Uh, amazing story. Uh, but in, in any case, um, I was there and uh, Sheikh Suhail was there. So with Sheikh Suhail being there, and he's actually duly trained, right? He's, he was trained at al Azhar and he's also trained as a social worker. Um, he was over the mental health part of access and his title of Sheikh and having had the experience of uh, people knowing him as such in the community would allow people to feel comfortable coming to access for mental health services. Mm. His giving them the sort of t approval that it was okay to see me for services was really effective for a certain group of people. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we made a really good team there. Um, right. It's like, um, not, it, like in lieu of board certified, it's like imam certified, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> so you've got the imam certification, uh, right. imam approved, four out of five imams approved. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly right, which is why this conference becomes so important, right? Exactly. Because there are very few Sheikh Suhails in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that, okay, so once we have the conference, we get the ideas, we make the publication, then any center that wants to, or um, let's say, uh, you know, mental health facility wants to offer services for Muslims, they can take this information, because they're not all going to have a Sheikh Suhail, but they can take this information with some sense of authority, Correct. right? And say, Correct. okay, we don't have a Sheikh Suhail here, but at least we know this from, this is what the scholars have had to say. Mm. This is what the mental health professionals who are working with this population have to say. And that in and of itself has at least some kind of authority. Um, right. and so, now among scholars that the, who are, who are, who are uh, confirmed to attend, um, you, do you have kind of a mixture of you know, academics as well as quote unquote traditional scholars, you know, like the Sheikh yeah. 
Tales of the World? Okay. okay. So, because one of the, so like the last session, um, the last session of the conference is about how we can fit chaplaincy into this mental health model as well. And so um, in that session, we have chaplains from around the country, um, Sheikh Suhail Mullah, right? It's going to be the discussant, but we have um, Sheikh Jamal Dewan, we mm. have uh, Omar Bajwa, we have um, from Yale, and we have um, Amjad Tarsin from University of Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. Um, on that on that particular session. Wonderful. But what we do throughout the different sessions is we're building up to the culminating sessions. So the first session <clears throat> is actually myself and my husband. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the theory of mind. Uh, and then we will build into the next session looking at is the mind, you know, connected to the body? Are we Are we integrated parts or are we you know, one whole part, what are we? Um, right. And uh, up there in the Bay, you know, Dr. Rania Awad, uh, she'll be on that session, um, as well as, uh, you know, we have, we have we have scholars from all over the place, right? So um, yeah. we have um, people like Imam Zaid Shakir who will be coming in and talking about, uh, one, on one of the relational sessions about family. Dr. Abdul uh, bin Hamid Ali will be on a session. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Drs. Omar Mahmoud and uh, Dr. Sassan Ahmed. They'll be yeah. coming back from overseas to be involved in sessions. So I've known Dr. Omar since sixth grade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 We. So we. we and uh, we, we reconnected in Michigan because when, when I had first moved to Michigan, he was still finishing up at Wayne State. So, yeah. Oh, wow. That's mashallah. That's fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's wonderful. Yeah, he's living overseas now. That's great. That's great, Dr. Yeah, Omar is fantastic. And uh, no, I, I, I was going to ask, and, and I imagine many of our listeners are probably asking, or, or uh, is um, is this just for practitioners or can us, you know, lay, lay, lay persons, lay people attend as well? No, yes, of course. It's, um, you know, I mean, certainly practitioners, clergy, Islamic, you know, people in Islamic studies, um, or any mental health professionals in general, or even ancillary professions would get most direct benefit, right? Correct. But we also have invited the community to attend because, you know, given our lineup of scholars and people involved <laughs> in the sessions, yeah. I'm sure we're going to learn, you know, much more than than just you know the obvious right. uh, you know there are um i mean it's just a you know a list of who's who i mean you know uh imam kazwini dr you know khalid abu fadl um abdullah rahman uh, no, it's an I, impressive list. No, no, yeah. it really is. Um, <laughs> is there a website uh, that you know offhand where people can go and access not only information about the conference, but also how to register? Yes. So we have a conference website set up. Um, it's it's nefshealertherapy.wixsite.com slash DEF, like for defining uh, Islamic psychology slash conference. Okay. Uh, so this is what we'll do. We, we for 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 listeners, uh, we'll, we'll have it in the link to the um, uh, to the podcast, so that way people can click on it and uh, and they can register there uh, and find out more information as well. Yeah. Um, can they also get information about the like the center at USC, or is that a separate uh, website? So the center at USC is the website is still under construction. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it's still. I, I expect it will be up in a couple of weeks. Right. Uh, but but the center has quote unquote launched already, correct? Or is this conference yeah, going yeah. to mark? It's the okay. center has launched, uh, but but yes, we are treating the gala as sort of an opening. Um, Wonderful. Primarily because even though the center has been active, we have not had a place to really share its full platform yet. And so that's what we'll be doing at the gala. The gala is not your typical gala, like a fundraiser, um, because we're not fundraising. Uh, having said that, we are kind of softly fundraising and that will put like envelopes on the tables kind of thing, but okay. nobody's gonna stand up and fundraise. It's more about people having a fun evening and, and learning about um, the center. 
uh, we do have Preacher Moss who's going to come and speak some comedic truths, you know? <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. So that's the ninth. That'll, that'll probably be in the evening. Um, and is there sort of a keynote speaker? Or like you said, people will just get more information about the center. Um, there, well, that we are trying to make a final decision about whether there'll be a keynote speaker because there's a lot of speaking already really happening that that's night. That's right. right? The, the next two days. <laughs> right, right. So right. Uh, we, we tried to intersperse actual entertainment with, uh, with the speaking. And then also uh, we're presenting awards. So the awards that are being presented are to acknowledge the work that has already been done. Um, because even though we've created the center and everything, we are not um, unaware of all the hard work that has been done previously that may have gotten overshadowed mm -hmm. or may have not been fully appreciated. And so um, our goal is to, to do that with these awards. Um, and, and, and so, you know, to hopefully set a good tone of, you know, we acknowledge what has been, we're moving forward to create more, you know, and, and just move forward. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, but before I let you go then, uh, thank you again so much uh, for joining us. But uh, before we let you go, um, maybe share with our listeners where people can engage you directly. Um, I know you also do um, uh, a series on YouTube. I'd love for you to talk about that and then where can our listeners engage you directly? So, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, we, yeah, we have our YouTube uh, series called Muslims and Mental Health. It's a little bit on hiatus right now, <clears throat> but we do plan to tape more uh, episodes in, you know, in the next few months. Uh, it's, it can be found on YouTube under Muslims and Mental Health uh, right. by Sister Heather, I think. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of re reaching me directly, I can be reached through the center, um, but I can also be reached uh, at nefshealertherapy at gmail.com. Or I can be reached by phone at 424-354-8095. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, I, I do have Twitter and uh, Facebook, but I'm honestly not planning to have them much longer. <laughs> got it. Got it. So email, traditional email, phone, uh, obviously your website. And uh, I imagine... Um, yeah, you've got the YouTube channel where people can uh, see content and probably engage you there as well. Uh, so, yes, you know, I, I just wanted to tell you about one other thing um, that, you know, I don't know why I didn't mention this earlier, but we actually got a grant recently um, to create a referral line for Muslim mental health. And so we will be doing that as well. Um, Has that referral line been set up? It's it, inshallah, we'll have it up by Ramadan. Um, wow. But it's it's really just to start here in SoCal, then expand to maybe California, to you know, um, and then maybe further. Um, but it's it's not a hotline; it's a referral line. Um, right. But our the people that will be manning the line will be duly trained for hotline because oftentimes people in the public don't know the difference, right? So um, they will have that training. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty cool that we, we got that. So Got the grant, yeah. Um, again, thank you so much, um, and thank you for joining us. Oh, and, uh, nice. you know, we, sure. haven't re okay. we haven't revisited this topic of Muslim mental health um, uh, in, in quite some time. You know, in the past, we've had therapists on the show, uh, Micah Anderson, who I, th who oh, I think yeah. you know, and, and Sabine Sheikh uh, out here in, um, in the Bay Area as well. She, uh, mm -hmm. she used to work with the Khalil Center. But uh, so it's been a while. We've been sort of remiss in having someone back on. And so I was very excited at the opportunity opportunity to have you on the show, um, not only to kind of talk about your own unique background, but also um, the work that you do. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And uh, um, like, 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 like we said, uh, listeners can find out more about the um, upcoming conference uh, via the link below, um, as well as uh, can engage um, and, and reach out to um, Dr. Uh, Heather Jackson as well. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, again, for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Pervez, before we wrap things up, I do have a listener letter here that I wanted to share with you. All right. I always, I always love uh, listening from, uh, hearing from our listeners. Thank you. And, and this is from Ruhi Yunus, and it is in reference to our uh, annual Star Wars review show that we do with Omar Muzaffar. 
And uh, so let me go ahead and read this. So she says, Dear Zaki and Professor, Assalamu alaikum. I hope all is well with you and yours. I've been listening to your podcast for about three years and love the insights and people who are interviewed, along with the introspection your hosting provides. Well, thank you for that. Uh, to thank provide you. some background, I'm a mother of three, including one infant. I watched Star Wars about two weeks after everyone else, which meant when I was ready to talk about it, everyone had moved on. But let me just say, I, I don't believe anyone has moved on. because <laughs> so I, true. I can't escape this. Uh, you know, on my Facebook, people keep posting <laughs> nonstop. As, as someone who gets regular updates from Zucky's, uh, 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 you know, Facebook uh, wall, I, I can I can attest to that. Like people I, are not letting this go. They yeah. they really are not. And I'm lit I'm trying to be as nice as possible and saying. No, so I think every thread you're like, I'm kind of done talking about yeah. this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and I'm, I'm genuinely, I appreciate the feedback, but I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm, no one's minds are being changed here. This is, we, we're dancing to the same song. Okay. I'm ready to move on. But, but so, so, so I, I want to live in this world where people have actually moved on. Cause that, that sounds kind of nice right about now, to be honest. Uh, regardless, she says, I happened to see your podcast and listened to it this past Monday and loved hearing the detailed breakdown of the film. It certainly satisfied my interests, but kept me waiting for one major theme to be brought to light. And and uh, Pervez, I got to say, this is yeah, this is kind of a gap in our discussion. Uh, nice. The strength of the female characters. Oh, this yeah. is a film in which yeah. none of the major female characters had a sensual scene. From Rose, Rose's sister, Leia, and Ray herself, there was not a sexually suggestive moment to recount. As I watched these three women upon the screen, I couldn't help but identify with their tenacity, self-sacrifice, wisdom, wit, strength, and confidence because as an American Muslim woman, these are values I cherish in the women I look up to. For me, this was the most satisfying aspect of the film. All the best, Ruhi. And and you know what's uh, my my thought is is I've spent so much time discussing this film that I I just assumed I had mentioned that on on our show, but I may yeah. have brought it up on the movie film show or elsewhere. But yeah, absolutely. You know, I've I've said that uh, uh, in in many places. I've seen you, and I wish you could just frankly read parts you've written uh, even in your social media because um, you know you've written so eloquently about Ray and 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 Admiral Haldo and and kind of where you know because. I think generally there's two criticisms that we, we, we see against these characters. One is the sort of, uh, oh, Ray is another uh, Mary Sue, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that and unpack that. And then the other being that, oh, how can we say Admiral Haldo was was if you pardon the expression, admirable, because she, you know, hid the, you know, she she didn't she didn't let uh, Poe in on on what the on what the plan was and. You know, and, and and you kind of follow the thread there, but um, uh, I'd love to kind of hear you kind of discuss it because I have seen you written uh, write about it, and I I think you're well. I mean, I mean the Mary Sue thing. So the the, the phrase Mary Sue has it it began as a reference to sort of when an author inserts a version of themselves into a work. Right, so it, it kind of rose in it, it, you know when people would write like Star Trek fan fiction, for example, right, and you'd have like oh it's it's Lieutenant Mary Sue and look how skilled she is and oh look Captain Kirk fell in love with her and you know like you you just it's like you role play yourself into a story, right? Got it. And okay. what what that's come to evolve into now because of just sort of you know the way these things go it's become like oh this perfect character who has no flaws right and that's sort of the ding that's been used on the character of ray and i i push back on that pretty hard because i'm like if if she was roy and he could do all the stuff she does nobody would be saying anything about it and i firmly believe that uh, I think it's a sexist attack and a way to diminish a strong female character. I, you'll never convince me otherwise with the with the vast majority of the complaints against the character. And I think uh, what the films that we've seen thus far, you know, just echoing what Ruhi has said. I mean, I I I really appreciate the fact that she is strong. She she is. Um, uh, she would pass the the Bechtel test, which is you know this measure of when a female character yeah. is on screen, how much time is she spending talking to another female character, how much time is she spending talking about a male character, and and you know she's she has agency all her own, and I think um, even in her her attire, her apparel, it's not overtly, uh, um, as she says, it's not uh, sexualized, you know. That's and, right. That's and, right. And you know, I mean, she's feminine without being sexualized. That, that's exactly right. She's allowed right. to be feminine. Right. I mean, there are and and she's where... tough. 
she's tough without having to be without masculinized being, without either. being yeah. you know lieutenant uh, Thank uh you. ramirez from from aliens or what was her name what was her name you know what i'm talking about the yeah, i do vasquez I do. Yeah. lieutenant vasquez, yeah, vasquez. You know? mm-hmm. yeah so so uh it's this real you know i mean she's allowed to cry yet she's allowed to you know like the, there's yeah. this this very interesting balancing act and that's something that i've noticed because obviously I, I appreciate the fact that she is such a strong role model and, and my see it in my nieces who just love her. Um, but well, I, also... I was going to, sorry, I was going to say I, like as the father of uh, now boys in movie going age, uh, how's that been? Well, Cause I mean, I'd love yeah, to share that's, my thoughts. That's, little, yeah, yeah. that's exactly. I mean, uh, for me, what's even more interesting is um, cause like I give, I buy my kids star Wars figures and they'll be like, Oh wait, we need this Ray. Oh, we don't have that Ray. You know? Like, cause you know, there's like the Ray who's with in this uniform, you know, and so just like they have with all, they have like eight different Luke Skywalkers. They're not like ew, the girl toy, you know, yeah. which, which I'm glad about, you know. Exactly, exactly. And as the father of two girls uh, who are, you know, one is a teenager, one is, uh, you know, nine, uh, it's been wonderful to have, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to take them to a franchise that is so dear to me, um, and have them find a character that is central and relatable to the story yeah. uh and uh it's just it's been wonderful and you know probably you know god willing inshallah by the by the next movie or, or you know comes along um you know your little girl you know might be old enough for you to take her and kind of see it in her eyes you yeah know? but that, that, uh, really uh right, now, right now she's a she's a tad a little young but little nonetheless bit. yeah, yeah well, maybe, she, maybe, i mean she'll be yeah <laughs> she'll be seeing them at some point you know she's not gonna exactly she's not gonna be my daughter and escape it yeah. so that's right. That's right. It, it is her <laughs> destiny. Yeah. No, that's a great point, and I and I, I think you were right. We were remiss not to, to to kind of talk about that or explore that on with this movie. I do recall as someone who does go back and hear past episodes of our own show um and, and i remember listening to the force awakens one uh that we did with omar muzaffer um just in preparation for that show for the last jedi show and i do remember we did call attention to that and how again as uh you know i think i re- literally repeated the same anecdote as a father of t- you know two daughters and what it meant to me yeah. um and i'll say the same thing about rogue one you know i i, I felt the same way about uh Gen- Or Gen- character so and there you go yeah. So uh, thank yeah. you for that letter. But thank you, Raheem. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you to everyone who writes in or uh, engages us on Facebook. Uh, uh, Zaki, if we don't have anything else, uh, maybe you can tell us where, where, tell our listeners where people can continue to reach out to us and uh, we'll engage them. Yeah, well, uh, uh, hit us up at our uh, email address, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. And you can message us there, of course. Also, please go to iTunes and leave a star rating, leave a review. Every little bit helps. And uh, just like Ruhi sent us a letter, please, whatever's on your mind, send it to us. We will do our level best to address it uh, uh, with as much uh, uh, honesty and uh, forthrightness as we can. That's right. And for those who uh, probably uh, found themselves in movie theaters quite often in 2017, I think you're... I'd love for you to tell them about your most recent podcast that you did because I always enjoy those annual shows that you and Brian do on your on our sister podcast. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're not uh, sister. I guess cousin. Cousin maybe. podcast. Step, <laughs> stepsister. I don't know what she would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the movie film podcast is a, a show I host with my partner Brian Hall, and uh, every uh, January, uh, our first January episode will always be our ten best movies of the year that just ended. So uh, that episode just dropped. So. Uh, Again, go to iTunes and do a search for movie film, one word, and you can find that, and hopefully you enjoy it. Exactly, because I know a lot of our listeners uh, do listen to the show and, and, and do read your reviews, so um, I think they'd love to check that out. So, uh, wonderful, and, and people can find you on Twitter at? Uh, at Zucky's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner, and that's also And you my... can hit, sorry, you can hit me up at Pervez, uh, Pervez F. Ahmed, and sorry, Zucky, I cut you off. Yeah, no, that, that's it, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening, guys, and thank you for joining us. And we look forward to uh, having you join us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Diffuse Congruence.